Hello and welcome to another D&D Stories. I'm not sure when this episode will air. I decided to make a Pokemon episode in case I should ever get sick or go on vacation or something like that. So if this is being posted up, it means I'm either strapped for time or I am away at the moment. So, uh, wow, Pokemon. I mean, yes, this is called D&D Stories, but you know, Pokemon is a, a very significant RPG that's that's really shaped the gaming community over the years. So, um, I thought I would share, I guess, a series of stories. I really don't have any main Pokemon stories to, to share because everybody's played at least one of the games. You know exactly how it goes. Eight badges, eight gems, Team Rocket, Team Aqua, Team whatever the hell. Um... So gosh, I would have been really, really little when uh, Pokemon Blue came out. I was still in like YMCA daycare. So what I'm going to do is share six, six or seven like small stories that went with Pokemon. None of them all really, um, really warrant like their own episode given that D&D &D stories is usually longer in terms of like talking or content or things like that. So the the six Pokemon that I'm going to show you, here's my trainer card. So, you know, have a look at these. This is not my Pokemon team. Don't worry. These are just, you know, I know this is a seemingly random grouping of Pokemon. They're, none of them are legendary. None of them are particularly powerful. But they are, these six are particularly significant to me. And I guess I have a story to go with each one. So I guess this is going to be like six stories in one. So yeah, okay. Uh, the first one you see there is, is Cloister, which is the evolved form of Shelter. Cloister, um, remember I told you that Pokemon Blue and Red came out when I was still in like YMCA daycare, which was like... School was out, summer was going on, but our parents really didn't have anything to do with us while they were still going to work, and not everybody could, could like, ship you off to an aunt or an uncle's house and, you know, things like that. So we would go to the YMCA, and they had a daycare program there for children of different age groups, and they had, you know, enough counselors to keep everybody happy, and we had activities and lunchtime and snack time and all that stuff. Basically just, you know, daycare sponsored by the YMCA. And, you know, Pokemon was, was just a big thing back when it, like, first hit America. It was everywhere. It was on TV, in comic books. Everybody was playing it and collecting the cards and watching the TV show and stuff like that. And, you know, I was, I was starting to get into it, too. And, like, the... I didn't own a Game Boy. You know, I didn't own... Pokemon like anything, but I would watch the show every day and I got like Nintendo Power Magazine where I could look at all the cool newfangled Pokemon stuff and while I was going to the YMCA daycare, uh, I had made friends with this kid. I, I don't even remember his name anymore. It was so long ago, but I made friends with this kid who who had like like a what did they call it? It's not a Game Boy Light. It's it was it wasn't a Game Boy Game Boy Pocket. That's what it was. It was a it was a black and white Game Boy, but it was slim so that it could go in your pocket. They called it the Game Boy Pocket, and and Nintendo made a big deal about it because you know it's not gray like a regular Game Boy is. You can get it in all these different cool colors. So it was like there was a blue Game Boy Pocket and a yellow one and a red one and all these different cool colors that you could play your games on. You know, even though the screen was still black and white, it was just like slightly smaller so you could fit it in your back pocket. And, you know, if you sat on it, it wouldn't like go up your butt crack and stuff like that. So this kid, 
that, that I was friends with started bringing his Game Boy to the YMCA, and he had uh, Pokemon Red, I think, in that Game Boy all the time. And he would sit and play it at lunch or during, like, quiet time when we're all supposed to be napping and junk like, yeah, they had nap time at the YMCA. God damn it. Like any of us were going to sleep. And he had the, uh, the Pokemon Red and Blue uh, player's guide. So we could, like flip through it and see like all the you know all the original original artwork that went with these things and like the ones that look like uh, watercolor paintings you know before they started like really putting time and effort into like serious uh quote unquote serious pokemon art and stuff like that the older versions of the artwork looked like watercolor paintings almost and we would i would flip through it all the time while he was sitting next to me playing it and the reason that this story is, is, is represented by Cloyster is that his favorite Pokemon was Cloyster. And I would like look over at it and I go, what is that? He goes, it's, it's basically like a, like a clamshell, but there's like a, a little black bead inside and it, and it like grins at you. And I would like lean over and you have to turn the Game Boy because it's, it's not like backlit, it's not in color, it's not anything. And it's this, it was just this weird little blob with a, with a green, a green, a grin on its face, like looking down at you. And the first, the very first Pokemon that I ever saw that wasn't like on TV or in a book or something, but like in game, the first Pokemon that I ever saw was a level 40 Cloyster. And I was like, that is so cool. And he showed me, you know, Bubble Beam and, and Surf, or maybe not Surf, but like all the different moves it could do. And I was like, wow, that's so neat. And he's level 40. Wow, he must be super strong and stuff like that. And, and you know, being the age group that we were, he, he never let me, like, play his Game Boy. But he would let me flip through that book all I wanted. And... And we would always say, whenever he was struggling in the game, we'd be like, bust out Cloyster, bust out Cloyster, he's awesome. And I watched that Pokemon just like, like over his shoulder from like level 40 to level 53 or whatever while he was playing Pokemon Red uh, just at that daycare. And while we were doing like art time and stuff, I drew, or I tried to draw pictures of, of like Cloyster. And you know he's he's not one of the easiest Pokemon to draw when you're when you're that young. And I have relatively good art skills. I've I've drawn like web comics and book covers. You know I know how to paint a little bit. I've I've got pretty good art skills to match with my storytelling skills. And I would try to draw Cloyster from this, and I basically couldn't do it because if you draw a Cloyster, he kind of looks like a layered vagina. So. <laughs> So the counselors would get upset at me, like, what are you drawing? And I would have to show them the picture that was in, like, the strategy guide all the time because it probably looked like a vagina when I drew it, just like a vagina with spikes all over it. <laughs> so, and, and again, this is when Pokemon was first catching on, so they had no idea what I was trying to draw. It just looked like a spiky vagina. <laughs> ah, God. But yeah, first Pokemon ever that I saw in-game, Cloyster. Um, the second one is, uh, is Jigglypuff. And Jigglypuff was kind of a, a dual sort of thing for me because, you know, when you're a kid, when you're, when you're like a really young kid, you tend to have like a favorite Disney movie or a favorite like series of, uh, of, of movies. Like, when I was really little, it was like Beetlejuice, Ghost, and Little Mermaid. And I would watch those three movies over and over and over again. And yeah, that's a really weird trio, especially Ghost, considering there's a, there's a sex scene in that movie. But yeah, Beetlejuice, Ghost, and Little Mermaid were like my three movies when I was a kid. But at the same time, I had one of the uh, the Pokemon VHS tapes and it had I think it had like two or three episodes on it but the main one that was on it was about Jigglypuff and I thought and I just fell in love with this pink balloon thing that would sing you to sleep and then draw all over your face because in the show Jigglypuff was like this 
you know, it wanted to be, you know, big and famous for its voice. But the joke became, you know, Jigglypuff's voice always sings you to sleep. So people, the people around it would fall asleep and it would get mad and it had like a permanent marker or some kind of magic marker with it all the time. And if you fell asleep in front of it, it would run over and get angry and like puff itself up because it's, it's the balloon Pokemon. It would puff itself up and run over and like draw mustaches and glasses and, and angry eyebrows on your face while you were asleep, and I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. And of course, since it was my only, like, Pokemon tape, you know, and unless it was like Saturday morning and you were watching cartoons or something, it was my only Pokemon tape, so I watched it over and over and over again. And eventually, you know, Jigglypuff became like my trademark Pokemon, um, when, whenever I eventually got a hold of the games and stuff, and Jigglypuff, I actually found out, you know, while it is weak in stats, it's very weak in stats comparatively, uh, because of its type, it can learn a lot of really unusual moves. So what I would do uh, when I eventually got a hold of the game, um, I would teach Jigglypuff, like, weird moves, like Ice Beam and like take down and just like these moves that it shouldn't have you know it's a normal I think it's a normal type and in the newest iterations Jigglypuff is like a fairy type which is a brand new type but back then I think Jigglypuff was a normal type and you because of that you could teach it a wide wide variety of elemental moves and it wouldn't do as much damage because it didn't have an element of its own but you could just catch, like, if you were doing, like, a linked battle with your friends, you could catch people off guard because, you know, it's it's a Jigglypuff. You think it's going to sing you to sleep and then, like, use Double Slap or use Pound or something like that. But no, I would p bring out Jigglypuff and then open the fight with Ice Beam. And it would just, what the hell, man? Or, well, you know, we were kids. What the heck, dude? And stuff like that. So Jigglypuff was like my main contender. Whenever I started a game, you know, I would run like as quickly as I could to a place, and I think in red and blue, Jigglypuff's like a rare Pokemon. You can only find it in a very small area, and it's a really low chance that one will appear. So you, I would run to that area as soon as I could and catch a Jigglypuff, and then I would take my starter Pokemon you know, Charmander, Bulbasaur, Squirtle, whatever, and put it in, in like, the PC system, and I would main with, with freaking Jigglypuff. <laughs> so, yeah, I had this pink, this pink balloon thing that knew Ice Beam and, like, Hyper Punch and things that it shouldn't know and would just, like, conquer other, conquer my friends with these really bizarre moves, and I would change it up, like, every couple of weeks or something, whenever we would get together for sleepovers or at the YMCA or whatever when we all had Game Boys, um, I would change up Jigglypuff's moves every time just so they wouldn't know what was coming and they really couldn't prepare for it because Jigglypuff could learn such a wide variety of things. It couldn't hit as hard, like I said, but you know, you didn't know if you had a type disadvantage or not because you know, does it know Fire Spin? Well, no, that's a Dragon-type move. But, you know, does it know Ice Beam? Does it know Mock Punch? Does, you know, what does it know this week, Tony? <laughs> I would change it up every time. But um, because of that tape, I, I ran with Jigglypuff for a long time. And, you know, when Pokemon Snap came out, and, you know, there's Jigglypuffs there, and I just thought that was the most awesome thing ever because you could get like three Jigglypuffs at the end of the of the cave section of of that game, or you could um, jig since Jigglypuff is like one of the one of the like poster Pokemon from back in the day, you'd see a lot of Pikachu and and like Charizard and and like Magnemite and and then there was Jigglypuff just as like a background character who would show up on the show whenever it wanted or it would show up in a lot of like the memorabilia and the McDonald's toys so you know you're never gonna find unless you really go looking you're not gonna find like an action figure of Cloyster but like Jigglypuff was easy to find so I've, I always thought that was cool uh... that's touched to my own taste um... the third 
Pokemon that goes on this list is is Ghastly. Now, why Ghastly? Why not Haunter or, or Gengar? Ghastly is actually very important to me because um, back when I was a little kid and I was I was like I was a really ornery little kid. I got into fights at school a lot, like like up through fifth grade. I was just a, a complete hellion. I would get into fights and like bite other children. <laughs> And, and like throw art supplies. I did not get along well with anybody, hardly. And you know, I was just a complete jerkwad as a kid. You know, it's like there's always that one kid in class that, that you know he's gonna cause trouble and he usually does. Oh, that was me up until like fifth grade. And then I calmed down for some reason. I must have worked it all out of my system. But back in, back when I was like still developing, as, as like an artist and a writer and stuff, I did a lot of reading because I would get in trouble so much. You know, I would get grounded. You know, I, I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't talk on the telephone. You know, couldn't have friends over. All the usual stuff that you get when you're grounded. And I would spend hours and hours either reading or drawing. And since I had issues of Nintendo Power, you know, I had, you know, Pokemon articles and and I could borrow the player's guide from one of my buddies and read about Pokemon, even if my Game Boy had been taken away and stuff like that. This, again, this was back when Pokemon was like, that was the shit when you were a kid, Pokemon. But, um, since I didn't get an allowance or anything, I, I really couldn't, like, enter the culture like a bunch of the other kids I knew. And one of the main parts of the culture was, uh, was the trading cards. You know, the Pokemon trading card game when, when you know, like, ch getting a, a hologram of, of Charizard was like you'd won the lottery or something, and those are actually still pretty valuable today. But I couldn't afford to buy Pokemon cards because, you know, I didn't get an allowance. I didn't, you know, I didn't really do chores around the house or anything, anything that would have earned me any kind of pocket money as a kid. So what I ended up doing was, like, bumming uh, cards off of some of my friends, like, the ones that they just didn't want, you know? But, you know, again, it's Pokemon cards, and Pokemon is the shit. So, you know, the, the cards that they had, like, five copies of or whatever, and, you know, we all collected the cards when we were kids. None of us knew how to actually play the game, you know, which was, <laughs> which was kind of the joke at the time, is that... We cared about how many hologram cards we had, and not so much, uh, or holofoil, but, and not so much how to actually play the game, so we would just, like, show off our collections to each other, and not actually play the, uh, the trading card game, but I would ask my friends, you know, say, hey, do you have, like, if you have, like, five copies of such and such, do you care if I have one? And they would give me cards, and the first time this happened, my best friend at the time, I think his name was Todd. Todd gave me uh, three Pokemon cards, just like from he had like this tin that he would keep them in and bring them to school. And he gave me a a trio of cards: uh, a Charmander, a Mankey, and a Ghastly. And since I was, and again, I'm I'm trying to bring this back full circle. I was in trouble so much as a kid, so I couldn't like do anything that required electricity, so I had a lot of art supplies, and since I had three Pokemon cards in front of me, I would set them in front of me on my desk and try to draw them. Now this, this kind of came with, with varying degrees of, of actually being successful, but Ghastly, uh, the original Ghastly card, was actually like computer generated, and he was like in a corner surrounded by graffiti and he was like a you could really tell that it was like a computer generated image just based on like the coloring and, and how it was presented but I looked at it and I was like well it's a it's a circle with eyeballs and like a mist around it so I can just like make that whatever shape I want I guess so I became very good at drawing ghastly because my friend Todd gave me a gave me a Pokemon card of Ghastly, and I, I just drew him over and over and over, because you really can't do it wrong. It's basically like drawing a, a broken egg, you know, the, the egg yolk, it's like the the center and, the, and then the white around it, but you could just like give it eyes and then color it black, and then color the white part purple, and you know, that's a Ghastly. 
You know, so I thought that was really clever when I was a kid because you really couldn't mess it up. <laughs> so I'd, I would spend hours just like drawing different iterations of Ghastly. And I would try to draw uh, Mankey, but I really couldn't do it beyond just like exactly what he looked like on the card. I couldn't draw it in different poses or anything. And I tried to draw Charmander, but it just didn't work. So I became very, very good at drawing Ghastly and eventually at drawing Jigglypuff because Jigglypuff is still, you know, it's a circle. You know, it's, it's not that hard. You know, it's a circle with feet and, and the little triangle ears. But Ghastly, I drew so much of him as a kid just because I thought he was cool. He was a, he was a smoke cloud with, with mean eyeballs. That was so neat. Now, um, around this time, like, like a couple of years later, uh, Silver and Gold came out. And Silver and Gold, I think, were the last Pokemon games that I, like, played all the way through. Like, I tried Sapphire, like, when I was in college, and I, and I tried, uh, Black and White, I think Black and White 1 or Black and White 2, but, you know, I never actually got very far in them just because of lack of interest. But way back in the day, when I was, you know, still a kid and, and really, really was into Pokemon, I got Silver, the Silver uh, version, and played the heck out of it. And one of my favorite Pokemon from uh, Red and Blue had always been uh, the, the Geodude family. You know, Geodude, Graveler, and, and Golem. And I just thought they looked cool, you know, because they were, they were like rock, rock monsters. I thought, oh, that's so cool. And then, you know, I looked back and I realized, wow, you know, Ghastly is a circle and, and Jigglypuff is a circle and Graveler is a circle. Look at all these balls around me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was starting to hit that stage as a kid, but... Uh, I, I say Graveler and not Golem, if only because, um... Uh, like, all of us had Game Boys, and all of us had Pokemon, but none of us had a link cable. None of us had a link cable, and we were always so frustrated with ourselves, because none of us got allowances, you know, and all of us got our Game Boys and, and Pokemon, uh, like, on birthdays or on Christmas and stuff. We would always, like, show each other our Pokemons, but, you know, it wasn't until way later that one of us or several of us actually managed to track down like a good link cable so that we could like evolve the tradable Pokemon. Like Graveler doesn't turn into Golem unless you unless you trade it to another Game Boy. So I had like Graveler on my team like all the time. Like it went like Jigglypuff and Graveler. Those two were always on my team. Always. Jigglypuff as like my starter like replacement because I would throw the starters into the PC. And then, like, I would run and catch a Geodude as soon as I could and evolve it into Graveler. And Graveler would always be on my team. The thing was, when I was playing Pokemon Blue, uh, you know, I had that Graveler and, you know, it made it all the way up through to the Hall of Fame, you know, at the very end of the game with, with you know, Jigglypuff and Zapdos and a couple other Pokemon that I just happened to have to, to beat the Elite Four. And, you know, I had treasured memories of that freaking Geodude. You know, even, like, his voice on the show, you know, Geodude, Geodude, and stuff like that. I thought that was so cool when I was a kid. And then, by some strange alignment of the planets, when I started playing Pokemon Silver, uh, w whichever cave you first go into, I, I don't know, where there's, where there's, like, Zubats and Geodudes running around everywhere, the very, very first Geodude that I ran into in Pokemon Silver was a shiny Geodude. And shiny Geodudes are golden, you know, instead of being like brown or like rock colored, you know, like Gravelers are gray and, and Geodudes are gray and, and, so are, and so are Golems. But the shiny version of the Geodude family is gold. And I just... I lost my shit. I was like, oh my god, a shiny Geodude! You know, because, you know, I had I had only just barely heard about shiny Pokemon because, you know, one of my little friends told me, you know, hey, if you come across a Pokemon that's got weird colors, you know, and it, it'll have like a shiny when it shows up, catch it right away because shiny Pokemon are really cool and they're really rare. 
you know, so, and the very first Geodude, which was a Pokemon I loved from, from Blue version, first Geodude I come across, golden Geodude, oh yeah, I, I threw every Pokeball I had and just whittled it down, like, I think with a Rattata, or, 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 whatever that game's version of Rattata is, it's one of the little rat things, but, I kept like nibbling on it until it had no HP left and I caught that motherfucker and oh my god I was so proud of myself it was like winning the lottery or, or just like Christmas had come early for me as a child because I caught a golden Geodude which of course became a golden Graveler which is why it's here on my trainer card as a, uh, as a shiny Graveler and of course I had to nickname him something cool and I thought of like like golden boy or golden golden ball or something like that. But then I realized, you know, he's a rock monster and he's made of gold. I'm gonna call him Nugget. <laughs> so I named my golden Geodude Nugget. And and of course, you know, Nugget became a golden graveler. Never became a golem, but you know, otherwise this trainer card would have a would have a golden uh, golem on it. But my God, was I so proud of myself and so happy for the rest of that damn game. You know, Lugia, no, no, don't care. Have a golden graveler. <laughs> so, so that one was really super important to me because it was, it was just, it's, and it's the one in a million shot. You know, I, I, I forget what the actual statistic for a, for a shiny Pokemon is. It's, it's like one in 6,700 at best, or it's a, it's like one in like, a serious number of thousands based on your your trainer number and the number of steps or your, or your your hidden stats that you don't get to see without hacking the game and you know I was a kid I didn't know about any of that but I won the freaking lottery finding that golden geodude and that just remained with me for the rest of that game and and just beyond nugget the the golden graveler now uh, the next guy you see there is is a golbat and I know, I know, Golbats are not not especially impressive. And, you know, I still remember in, in Pokemon Red and Blue, he had like a big long tongue hanging out of his <laughs> hanging out of his mouth. But um in in the later iterations they, they removed the tongue. I don't know why. I guess like they maybe somebody was offended by the tongue, but whatever. There's still like lick a tongue and haunter and stuff and things like that. But Golbat actually uh, is significant to me because I caught a Zubat, which, you know, they're the most common thing since Caterpie or since Pidgey. You know, as long as you're in a cave, you're going to get stopped by Zubats, you know, three bazillion times while you're just trying to make it out to the other side. But I caught a Zubat and I wanted to, you know, at the time I think I was in like middle school. My, my best friend's birthday was coming up. I, I forget his name, God. Because you have so many best friends through, through grade school. But my best friend really liked to give his Pokemon, like, joke names. And he had, he had like, Felix the Caterpie from the Pokemon comics. And just, just all kinds of just goofy names for all of his... I, th I think he, he had a Geodude and he named it Turd because it was, it was brown on, on uh, whenever he had one in a coloring book or something. But um, I, I wanted to give him a Pokemon as, as a birthday present. And so what I did was, you know, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give him like a legendary bird. I'm not going to give him Mewtwo or Ditto or, or, or like a Polyrath or anything like that. I need to find something that he would appreciate, like, like, based on his sense of humor. So what I did was, I caught a Zubat and I evolved it into a Golbat. And I called it, uh, what was it, Omnom. Like, like the sound you see in comics when somebody's, when somebody's eating something, Omnom, Nom, Nom, like that. Since he has such a big mouth and the little fangs and things. And I taught him, uh, all the eating-based moves. So it was like, bite and Hyper Fang, and, and, what is it, it was like Metal, Metal Fang, or it was some kind of steel-based move, but I taught him four, like, biting kind of moves, and I named him Omnom, and then I said, okay, dude, go, go catch, like, a, 
I guess it was, was it Bidoof or whatever, whatever the most common thing was in, in silver and gold. But I said, go, go catch, you know, something really common and I want to give you your present. You can just give me, you know, whatever else that we can use as like trading bait. And, and I give him this this gold bat, and he falls in love with it immediately. It's it's a gold bat called Omnom with with four biting moves, and he loved it. And he brought it to like our our gaming club get-togethers and to the YMCA uh, daycare thing, and to to like the the middle school gaming clubs and different things like that. When when we got up to uh, middle school, or when we or not, not the daycare, the, like, sleepovers and stuff like that, he would always have it out in his team. Or when we were playing Pokemon Stadium, he would bring Omnom out and just show off all the biting moves because he thought it was the most hilarious thing he'd ever seen. <laughs> so, so it was a good birthday present for him on my part, so I, I did a pretty good job there. Um... The last one is Doug Trio, and, and I kind of have to let you in on a, on a more personal side of my life to explain this, is that my mother and father divorced when I was like three, and they, they lived in, Virgin or in Georgia at the time. My mom went home to Virginia, and my dad went home to Kentucky, because he was he'd retired from the Navy, so we were roughly 800 miles apart, but you know, we would talk on the phone twice a week, you know, no matter how young I was, you know, she would always call at least once a week, and, and we would talk for a long time, every time. And, you know, she would want to know what was going on in my life, and she, you know, she provided my dad with money, and, you know, the, the, the divorce was, you know, peaceful, you know, it, it's, it's a nice way to put it. But, uh, or mutual, rather, is, is, a good, is a good way to put it. And, um... You know, I would visit her during during the summers for like a month at a time when school was out or, or like six weeks at a time when I wasn't going to elementary school or whatever. And, you know, being that my mother did not live with me most of the time, you know, I had this Game Boy and, and she had heard that, you know, my dad had had taken my change jar that I was saving up to buy Pokemon with. And, and uh, we went and got me a Game Boy and, and Pokemon Blue. This was, was like the, one of the very few things that my dad was like, yeah, let's just go buy that. Because he saw me saving for it and saw me drawing pictures and all that other stuff. So he just, he just suddenly indulged me, which blew my mind as a kid. And that was just so cool. We went to get a Game Boy Pocket and, and Pokemon Blue so I could, you know, join the, join the international sensation. And one of the... And I set that all up, again, because uh, I was so into it at the time, I was actually, uh, I would turn the volume down on my Game Boy until it was silent. And whenever my mom would call, I would, like, go and, like, grind levels while she was talking to me. It's not that I wasn't listening, you know, because obviously, you know, I can hear and I can talk and, you know, I can, I can hit the A button and, you know, still pay attention to what she's saying. And I never got caught doing that, except once. It was when I was playing Pokemon Blue. Um, I was in like Diglett's Cave or something, which is like a cave where there's only ever... I don't remember if it's only Diglett's or if it's like Diglett's and Zubat's, but it's, it's just called Diglett's Cave because that's where you go to buy Diglett's. And occasionally you'll run across its evolved form, which is, you know, Doug Trio. And Doug Trio is basically just three Diglets mushed together uh, into one Pokemon, and they appear at, like, roughly level 30 or level 27 or something like that. They're, uh, you know, at that stage in the game, they're relatively powerful if you don't, like, be careful around them because they know pretty good moves and they're a ground type and you know, various other things. I don't think wild dig tr dug trios can dig or anything like that, but, like, they would they would show up and do some serious damage if you weren't paying attention. And while I was on the phone with my mother, I caught... Hmm, excuse me. I caught a dug trio just on the off chance. Like, I think it had more than half of its health left, and I just... I tried to jab at it with a, with a water type, and I either missed or didn't do much damage or something like that. 
but I threw a Pokeball on the off chance and I caught it. And it's like in the middle of this conversation with my mother on the telephone, I just jumped out. I was like, I caught a dog trail! Yes! <laughs> My mom had no idea what was going on here. She's 800 miles away on the phone. It's like, and I'm just like up and dancing because I'm a kid. Just I'm a little kid, and that's what I do. And it's like I called a dog trio. I called a dog trio, and I'm just I'm like dancing around the room with the phone is on the floor, and she could just like she can hear me chanting and dancing around the room. She has no idea. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't you know, pay attention to Pokemon. You know, she doesn't have any children around the house. She's 800 miles away. But, she... <laughs> I was dancing around the room. I caught a Doug Trio. For, for like, two, three minutes before I remembered she was on the phone. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mom. But, uh, she, she did not let that go for a long time. She wasn't mad. She actually thought it was really funny. And she probably, like started paying attention to what Pokemon was after that, but like just in the middle of this conversation, got up, danced, shouted, all that good stuff. <laughs> so so Doug Trio kind of kind of got a a uh, a spot in my Pokemon memories just because of that, just because I, I completely forgot I was on the telephone with my mother in just like a split second of, of unbridled joy and you know I I don't think I even actually used Doug Trio for anything he was just kind of there and he looked cool and he was level 30 and I just I caught him under really bad circumstances just the kid and me just imploded with joy <laughs> uh, what else I did you know and those those are like the main six stories and those are all like joyful stories and eventually I did come across, um, I do have one bad story, and it's not, it's not associated with any particular Pokemon, unfortunately, but, um, this took place many, many years later, so I guess around the time that, like, Black and White 1 was coming out, somewhere around there, I had just, uh, I had just graduated from college, and... Gosh, I'm trying to remember the details as far as like a time frame, but I had just graduated from college and one of my friends, uh, let's, let's change the name, hang on, let's call her Jennifer. My friend Jennifer, you know, all through elementary school, all through middle school, high school, up through college was a, a video game fanatic. And, you know, she and her brother just like video games were their lives and we, we, just, just my god, you would never see them doing anything else unless they were playing Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering or something like that. And because of the job slump at the time, you know, uh, we both went away to college at the same time. Jennifer came home a year before me, if only on her own brilliance, because she was actually much, much brighter than me. And, you know, I, I rode her coattails through geometry in, in high school. But, um... She got home from college, like graduated, like a year before me, finished college in three years. I was astounded and absolutely jealous. Because of the job slump at the time, it was very difficult for somebody fresh out of college, you know, probably had, I, I don't know this, probably had like student loan debts and things like that, um, went for, for a whole year without a job. And I thought, my gosh, and you know, I'm sitting there doing my last year of school, I'm like, my gosh, it must be so harsh out there. Because Jennifer is so smart, and she's got like a 3.8 GPA, and was so smart in math, and did so well in band, and is like this super successful girl. We were never like romantically involved or anything. She was like, like, like the best friend you would never date, and you would never look at that way. She was just like, she was basically one of the guys. <laughs> but, um... Just this brilliant girl, brilliant. And I thought, my gosh, it's been a year and Jennifer can't find a job. What kind of chance do I have? And I got home from college and, you know, we would have like get togethers with me and Jennifer and a bunch of the guys. And, and you know, now and then we would bring our respective girlfriends along to just have like a board gaming night kind of thing. 
And I learned over a series of months after I had gotten home, I was working at a, at a printing press at the time, so relatively good money, just a horrible job. And I learned after a series of months of us just like getting together each week to play games that Jennifer wasn't, she wasn't not looking for a job, but she was turning jobs down. And the reason for this, and, and just like brace yourself for this because a normal person can't comprehend this. The reason she didn't have a job is because she had promised a, a local comic book shop that she would, um, she would host the Pokemon trading card game tournaments each week. And whenever she got a job offer, and I saw this happen twice, twice, and these are the ones that I had mentioned, that I had, like, witnessed. I don't know what happened the rest of the year. Found out that she turned down job offers because she had already given her word that she would, she would, like, officiate and, like, like, mentor these other kids in Pokemon trading card tournaments. I'm like, Jennifer, you're, you're freaking 22, you're 23. I'm not saying that you can't have like a Pokemon hobby because there are tons of really intense people that are adults that play Pokemon like religiously, but you can't not have a job because of Pokemon. And like, I don't know if she didn't want to hear it or if like she got angry because she, the, her, her logic was that she had given her word and she was, she was, you know, a very passionate, very upright person. So once she gives her word, she's given her word. But, uh, I said, Jennifer, you're, you, you can't not have a job because of Pokemon. And she either didn't want to listen or didn't, you know, the, the priority was unto her honor uh, about saying that she was going to do something and that she would do it. And finally, I, I, I kind of broke down and snapped at her, like over Facebook or something. I said, Jennifer, I'm, I'm disgusted with you. You know, look in a mirror and say it out loud. Say that, you know, I turned down a job offer after a year of unemployment to run a Pokemon trading card game tournament. Say it out loud. Look at yourself in the mirror. Do it. She didn't speak to me for almost a month. But, and I don't say this to, uh, to toot my own horn, I don't say this because I'm proud of it, and I don't say this to sound like a jerk, but less than a week after I posted that, that like, really mean response to, uh, to Jennifer, she, less than a week later, she had a job. Bam. Done. Ten bucks an hour, forty hours a week. So I don't know if like me being mean was the swifter kick in the pants or or if she really did look in the mirror and do it. I hope she did. But just like a week, maybe less, 10 bucks an hour, 40 hours a week, done. After a year of sitting on her butt. The timing, I, I almost didn't want to believe that it was me. But, it, you know, the timing was a little too convenient, you know? So... It probably was. And I, I did feel, and our friendship did recover, you know, over time. You know, they, we still got together at my house to do these weekly board gaming nights and stuff like that. But, I don't know. I feel like I, I was like the jolt or the, the swifter kick to the butt that she might have needed to actually get a job over something like Pokemon. My God. So... Pokemon kind of became tainted in my eyes, if only because it, it was wrecking the life of one of my best friends. So I don't, I don't really play the games anymore because there are so many Pokemon now. There's like Ice Cream Cone Pokemon and, and you know, a set of keys Pokemon and a garbage Pokemon. It's like they're not even animals anymore. They're not even trying. So it's kind of lost its charm, you know, with me. But I have all these wonderful memories and just all the get-togethers and, and the six Pokemon that I'm showing you here and just everything that had to do with anything of, of the, the giant influence of what Pokemon was to me. So those are my six or seven Pokemon stories. I hope you guys enjoyed them. And I will hopefully see you guys next time on D&D &D Stories. So until next time...
keep gaming.